the question that I ask myself and my team asks ourselves every day is this, like, have we earned a fan today? Because when you think about the 1,000 true fans, that's a fan a day for less than three years. Some people struggle with business for years before they make it. But if you just had one new fan a day, less than three years, six figures. What's up, everybody? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast with your boys, Matt Wolf and Joe Fear. All right, Pat, we're rolling. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing excellent. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, my man. So we, what, it was eight months ago, maybe it was towards the beginning of this whole lockdown pandemic. We did a, well, you were part of the live stream. We're doing yeah. an affiliate marketing live stream and your session, yours and James Shramko, which I know James Shramko was the one that I think connected us or reconnected us. Yeah. Um, and it was just like, it was just fire. I mean, everyone was just like, okay, Pat and Shramko, it's like <laughs> so actionable. And these are people that have been dying to get into affiliate marketing. So I think combining that with super fans, your, your newest book of what the three you have out, I believe you have, yep. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. which is awesome, man. I think it's just going to be the perfect combo hybrid if we focus on that with this discussion. And I think it's kind of unique. I don't know if you've combined those two before, but. <laughs> no, I haven't actually. You know, I usually just talk about in general what can happen when you build a super fan. You know, that fanatic who you just come out with something or recommend something, they're, they're on it, right? Like that's what we're talking about. But that doesn't happen overnight. Like the, the moment people find your page or your website or hear you on a podcast for the first time, that's not going to incite them to do that right away. There's a journey. There's a, there's a sort of like process to that. And once you unlock that though, it's like, you know, I have fans who I can just, I can literally promote like a block of ice and people would buy it. And I'm like, first of all, I would never sell ice. <laughs> um, and you know, everything I sell is fire. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but you know, secondly, it's like, that's the kind of craziness that can happen. Um, but it it's a process. It takes time and affiliate marketing. I mean, just that in general is the easiest way to start generating an income because these products already exist. People out there in the world are already buying them. You just have to be the person that people trust a fan to mm. make that recommendation to them. And, you know, the cool thing about this whole thing is everybody wins. That's the kind of marketing I like where everybody wins. You win because you get a commission your customer or, or subscriber wins because they're getting something they need and the company wins because they're getting a new customer. And so, you know, it's just a beautiful situation. Yeah, it is, man. So uh, really quick. And I think what's interesting right now with the pandemic, with the world just kind of changing at light speed right now, the way that you started back in 08, I think it's fascinating and it's probably a good revisit that little story, even though people might've heard it again, but I think that'd be a good way to start off and, you know, kind of give a little bit of hope, but also perspective from your side and how it relates yeah, here. For sure. You know, I have, I hired a PR person when the pandemic happened because I know that my story from 08 is very similar to people's stories now. No, we didn't have a pandemic then, but we had a recession and everybody was losing their job, including myself. And I, I actually went into a deep dark hole. This was June 17th, 2008. I had my dream job. I had just proposed to my girlfriend. We were just set for, for an, a perfect life. And all of a sudden, all that got taken away from me. And it was hard. I had no plan B. I had done everything I could to have this secure job. And yet I still got let go. And I just was very confused, didn't know what to do, was sitting in bed watching Back to the Future like every day because that was the only thing <laughs> that I could escape with. And I would like just hope that there was an actual time machine I could go back in time with. And of course, <laughs> you know, after one hour and 56 minutes, back to reality. And so, you know, after a few weeks, though, I started to realize, like, what am I doing? Like, I'm just sitting here hoping things were different when, you know, things are different, hoping things were back to the way they used to be. But it can't be like that. And we're in the pandemic now. And there's there's so many things that are different right now. But then I started to think about, well, OK, well, what does this make possible? Right. Like what actually now is unlocked for me as a result of this? You know, here in the pandemic now, this has definitely unlocked the ability for me to slow down a little bit and be more closer to my family to do a lot of fun things together at the house, to actually reduce the amount of travel that's going to happen even when things open back up again. And, that, and that's huge. And back then in 2008, when I got laid off, what made possible was this idea of, well, maybe there is something else that I can do. I thought I was going to be an architect for my whole life. Hmm. And yet here was something telling me, well, maybe not. So then I discovered this podcast. Long story short, I ended up uh, through inspiration from that podcast, building an online business, helping people pass an architectural exam. That did very, very well. I ended up making over $200,000 in a year doing that. And then at the end of 2008, I decided to just share all that, to just share honestly what happened. I had no idea this world existed. I just dove super deep into it. And probably the biggest lesson I learned was that like, you know, with my upbringing, 
trying to be perfect, uh, coming home with a 96% on my math test and my dad saying, what happened to the other 4%? Like, that's how I grew up. Right. Mm. And I, I was graduated top of my class all the time. Um, no mistakes. If you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to make money, you have to make mistakes. You have to put yourself out there. You have to fail. And that was a very hard thing for me to learn. And a lot of us, I know we feel like we're failing right now, or we're making a lot of mistakes. Or we're just not sure what's going to happen, but you can either tell yourself that's because things are, are bad, or you could tell yourself that's because we're setting things up to be good later. And you get to make that story back to the future. It's not real, but there is truth behind the idea that the events that happen now and how you react to them and what you do with the opportunity writes your entire story of your future. Um, so I'm very grateful now because now having a business owner, having been a business owner for 12 years, uh, a podcaster for 10, um, YouTuber, author, keynote speaker, all these things, like I've helped millions of people all around the world in, in many different ways. And, you know, my favorite thing still to this, this day is number one, the fact that I can have my own schedule and be with the family most of the day. And number two, every time I go back into my inbox every day, there's at least, you know, a few people who say, you know, you've changed my life. Thank you. Um, and that's really cool because I didn't plan for this. <laughs> <laughs> so the layoff was the best thing that ever happened to me. Honestly. Oh, man. Now, do, do you think right now in this current sort of pandemic that we're in now, do you think uh, going the path that you went down, content marketing, podcasting, that sort of thing, do you think that's still a, a sort of viable path that people should be experimenting with right now? Uh, a thousand percent. I think it's even more valuable during this time when we can't see other people in person. So how might we actually connect with others? It's online. And when you can pick a platform to start on, whether it's podcast, blog, uh, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, wherever, there are people there who could benefit from knowing and learning from you, from uh, getting motivated by you and all the great things you have to share. And, you know, a part of also what I struggled with was, well, I didn't go to business school. I'm supposed to be an architect because I went to school for architecture, right? And I had to let go. And that was the name of my first book, Let Go, not just because I was let go, but because in order for me to grow as an entrepreneur, I had to let go of the ladder I thought I was on the corporate ladder and that, that path. And I, here I was presented with the entrepreneurial ladder and I had two hands on it and one foot, but I still had that other foot on the, on the corporate ladder, right? You can't climb a new ladder if you still have your leg on the other one. I had to let go. And that was a little bit of a leap. Um, there are ways to help yourself and connect with other people and learn from the right people to get a stronger grip on that new ladder, if you will. But uh, when I let go, things started to fly. Things started is to fly. That, is that really good? I love that analogy, the whole climb two letters at once. Yeah, good luck with that. So when it comes to perfectionism on your side, like back in the day, do you, is that something you still struggle with? And if so, how did you let go of that? <laughs> if a little bit, maybe. Uh, a thousand percent, I still struggle with it. I think it's just, I've been conditioned to mm -hmm. uh, want to be perfect. Um, part of what helps me are deadlines. In fact, mm -hmm. if I have a deadline on something, I only have so much time to work on it and then it's there, right? So now I'm sort of forced to go, okay, this can't be perfect, but I have to have it good enough to unlock the next stage or mm. to be a product for my audience and something that at least is a first iteration, right? I mean, I, 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 if I still had uh, believed in perfectionism and tried to go down that route, I would not have books. I would not have videos. I would not have a podcast. And the idea of just incrementally getting better over time now excites me more than being perfect right from the start. It almost is like this idea, I heard this study once of hotel reviews, right? There was a study done of hotels and based on customer reviews, like they would see which uh, hotels were better. The hotels that got the highest ratings were actually ones that had had mistakes happen, but then they were able to fix them. Like the customer service was great. Mm. Those hotels ranked higher than hotels that actually were perfect, which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, and so we could treat our lives in sort of the same sort of fashion. Yeah, I guess it's like if you take that analogy or that story that you just said with hotels and go look at some of these travel blogs or uh, what's the rating one? Um, uh, TripAdvisor, that's the one. Mm. And you see all the reviews and it's like the hotels that have the complaints and there's no responses from the hotel. But then the one that might have some complaints, but every single one's responded to, you can see it's just that trust built immediately from the new perspective person. I'm sure, sure that's how a factor of fans getting built as well in that relationship. Absolutely. I mean, one thing that I talk about in my book is this principle of never leave any handshake unshook. I mm. think that's how I phrase it. <laughs> um, and how many times do we have comments and replies to things? And, uh, you know, uh, I, I saw this the other day, my friend of mine created a Facebook group. 
And he's like, yo, we got like a hundred people in now and people are, are commenting and they're sharing things. And he didn't respond to any one of them. He was just so stoked to have this membership. And he was like, well, they're going to talk to each other. Right. And I'm like, well, you have to, you have to lead up to that. That's not going to happen right away. And especially with like, Hey, I'm Jim and I'm from here. And this is like my struggle. If they don't get an answer, it's like, okay, well, this is not my place. Like I'm yeah. going to leave and find somebody else. One of my favorite things to do instead of like waiting for somebody to reach out their hand, although, you know, COVID, you know, <laughs> any, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and then me shaking it, I want to reach out my hand first. And actually at the end of the book, I talk about this thing called the what's up. And the what's up is so easy because all you have to do is on Instagram, for example, or Twitter or Facebook, anybody who has recently interacted with a post that was meant for many, go to the individual who commented and reach out to them in a video, in a direct message. And in that video, say their name, say hello, thank them for the comment, literally no other thing than that, right? This is what we like to call digging your well before you're thirsty. You're establishing these relationships. You're creating very personable moments such that by the time you might need something, or if you're a marketer, perhaps you might have an offer. Well, now it's not, oh, you're only reaching out to me because you have an offer. It's like, well, no, you've already spent time building these relationships. And I'll tell you, these personal messages, 98% reply rate, people's minds are blown because they're not expecting it. And it's the, the, the analogy is like when you're at a restaurant and you're drinking your water and it's like half empty and you, have, you go, hey, waiter, can I have some more water? And then you give them more water. More pe most people online are giving the water when people ask for it. But what if that person didn't even have to ask for water and you as the waiter come around and pour it for them? That little kind of attention goes a very, very long way. And that what, that's what makes people go, yeah, I like this place or I like this person. I'm going to stick around here because you know I get treated well and I'm being paid attention to because that's human nature. We want to know we belong to something. We want to know there's connection, especially today. Hmm. I love that. Yeah, and that was something in your book. Uh, I forget what I think it was eh, one of the chapters, but you're talking about Bonjoro and um, and it was convert exactly. kit. And that's something I, I was just smiling, lighting up because uh, on the affiliate side of stuff and even our new members all send out random loom videos, uh, you know, custom videos and uh, either thanking them, welcoming them or just answering a question. And like you said, almost every person responds. Most people say, you just made my day. That was completely unexpected. I'm like, it's so mm -hmm. simple, but it's a non-scalable thing. Yeah, yeah, it's so worth it. And we preach that all the time. I read it, I was yeah. like, yes, yeah. they're doing it too. That's true, you said, you, you said a key word there. It's, it's not necessarily scalable. Um, not everything in business has to be automated. You know, there are right. certain things like this that should have some real personal touch. I mean, I would try to become as efficient and as automated as possible so that you have time to go the extra mile that others won't. One thing that I do is every Friday, I go out on a walk. So uh, today, actually, after my calls today, I'm gonna take my dog out on a walk. I'm gonna have my phone in my other hand and I'm just gonna start going down the line. And I'm not gonna be able to get to everybody, but number one, I'm getting exercise, my dog's getting exercise and I'm making real connections all at the same time. And no, it's not in front of a studio camera and beautiful light. I'm just on a walk, it's choppy. And it should be that way because it's real life. And I'm real life trying to make a connection. Oh, man. That's the best. And that's the key. Yeah, I always go outside when I do my item. I'm just going to sit in the backyard, chill in a chair. And everyone's like, dude, it's like I'm just hanging out with you. I'm like, that's yeah, the point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like Matt from ConvertKit was hired to do the Bonjour videos for new customers. Mm -hmm. Like an email software company creating personalized videos that mentions people's names and also the website if they included that in, in the form. Matt lost like, I don't know, 20 pounds or something like that <laughs> doing this too. So yeah, man. Oh, yeah. That's so cool. Well, I, I guess my next question on that topic would be once you do sort of achieve scale from your personal brand, let's say you have hundreds of thousands or even in the millions of people paying attention, how, how are you keeping up with that? Or are you just kind of getting through who you can get through and um, next day do it again? That's a fantastic question because there came a point in 2013 where I was getting burnt out on trying to answer every single person's comment and question and email. And it just became impossible. If I wanted to answer everybody, I would have no time for anything else, including family. So how does one scale with that? Um, I think if you're just starting out and you're small, your superpower is your ability to actually do that still, right? And so don't discount the 100 email subscribers you have because those are 100 humans, 100 actual people that a brand like me couldn't personally connect with all of them. And so use that to your advantage. Small is great, right? But as you grow, you start to kind of struggle a little bit. And if you just continue to do the same thing you were doing, you're going to burn out. 
or you're just going to let a lot of people down. And so what I ended up, ha- what ended up happening, take in point my email inbox, it got to a point where there was over 10,000 unread emails. Like it got crazy. <laughs> and I just mm. felt bad because every day I'd see, oh, there's another 50 emails that I'm not going to answer and I'm going to let these people down. So I had to build systems. I had to have uh, Jess come on to help me manage my inbox because many of those emails, most of them didn't require an answer from me um, and, and many didn't require an answer at all. And then what we do together is she only lets me see the emails that I have to respond to. And at the same time, she answers as Jess, not pretending to be me, for things that she knows how to answer already. And you know what? Nobody's ever said, you know what, Pat? I had a question. I asked you a question and Jess answered it. I was so mad because you didn't answer it. (laughs) They're so stoked that I've built something that can help them even faster than I can do myself. Hmm. The other thing that I do is on my website and and many other places you know, I, I basically set the expectation. Like I cannot possibly reach out to everybody anymore and respond. Um, my team and I, we're going to do our best. Um, and, 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 you know, just know that we see your emails and, and we will get back to you when we can. And then of course, if I have the time or they do get a response right away, you know, we, we, we set the expectation that they weren't going to get one right away. They're blown away. Right. Mm. So now there's like a little bit of a bonus. There was a, um, there's an airline company, KLM, uh, mm-hmm. Dutch mm-hmm. airlines, they had at one point this thing on their Twitter account, their artwork for their Twitter page or cover art would say, you can expect a reply within 30 minutes. And they change it every five minutes. They just know the volume and they calculate that. And so I was looking at that and I was like, wow, that's really neat for especially an airline company. But now a person will sort of complain about something and at least like give them the 30 minutes to like respond and not feel like they're not being heard or, or whatever. So I just for fun tweeted them and I was like, hey, at KLM, like never been to that part of the world before. Like, where would you recommend I go? They replied in 13 minutes. <laughs> and I was bad. like, dude, this is sick. And then like, you know, they sign it off with the name, the initials of the person, on who, whoever it is. And I felt like I was talking to a real, this is a company that has thousands of employees, an airline company, and it feels personable. So mm-hmm. don't feel like you have to have a personal brand to make it feel personable. So then we were interacting with each other and I was just like, hey, like, how do you do this? And they're like, well, we know people want to get answers soon. And, and we've built the system to do that for you here on Twitter specifically. And now it's just like, wow, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. <laughs> That's the thing, man. I mean, a lot of folks, we just lose track of people when there's just a screen in front of us or even not zoom, you know, just text. And it's, kind of wild. It's something we've talked about a lot is like, how do we bring that personal connection, even if we can't be right there with each other? Mm-hmm. And I, I know your book is so super fans. Everyone should definitely grab that link in the show notes, all that fun stuff. Um, and, but I want you to go through kind of your perspective of, cause you mentioned the thousand true fans concept and that's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty famous uh, article that was written, what, like 10, so yeah, year, 12 Kevin years ago, 2006 or something like that. Yeah. Years ago. So I want to hear your perspective of, uh, you don't have to bring everyone. You don't have to even have funnels really. Cause I like, there's a line you said somewhere, I don't know if it was in the book or a podcast is funnels aren't, they don't create fans for you. Funnels aren't creating fans for you. It's, it's this process that you take people through. So um, yeah. yeah, I'd love it's, your perspective on the whole thousand true fans concept. It, funnels are important by the way. I mean, it yeah. creates systems to then allow yourself more time to do these, these things that can help you gain more fans. Um, but they're not created overnight and they are created by the moments that you create for them over time from the moment they find you to the moment that they're, you know, paying VIP dollars to go to your event and spend time with you and take photos backstage. And, you know, they they feel great about it. Like they just take you up on that offer. Uh, but, but when it, when it comes to fans, particularly the, the most important thing is like, you know, a lot of us are building to get more eyeballs and that's great. But if you try to serve everybody, you're actually going to serve nobody, right? It's like the difference between, you know, if you're going to open a shoe store and it's like a general shoe store, I I want basketball shoes and casual shoes and the high heels for the women and the kids shoes and the ones who are going to be running a marathon. It's going to be so difficult to have a unique selling proposition unless you make everything cheap as heck, right? Mm -hmm. And that's who is selling the general shoes. There's Walmart and Target and Shoe Pavilion and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. I would much rather go, okay, well, who am I serving first? And what are their needs? All right, I'm going to serve marathon runners, right? Like that's my niche, okay? That wipes out millions of people. There are millions of everybody mostly wears shoes. 
Now I'm only focusing on such a small percentage of people who need shoes, but you know what? I'm going to be more successful because the riches are in the niches. And I know it's pronounced niches. Don't at me on that, but it rhymes better. Um, so now I have my shoe store where branding wise, I can tie into the psychology of the runner. Um, I can create something, an environment where a person can come in and feel like they're going to be running their first race or, or they're winning the race. The shoes in particular, the distribution line is so different now because I'm only focusing on shoes and it all ties into who am I serving? I can have them come in and I can go, Hey, where are you running next? And, Oh, I'm running my first marathon. Cool. Here's some shoes that'll help you. If you have wider feet, here's shoes that'll help you, you know, whatever, like all things become easier when you niche down. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is with thousand true fans, like the numbers, when you run the numbers, it's like, well, that's so obvious. I don't need a million fans. I don't need to make the next Uber or, 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 Tesla or fidget spinner or whatever. <laughs> I just need a thousand true fans. Those true fans. So let's do some math here. Like a, a thousand people paying. Let's go, let's go, let's go ge like generous here uh, or, or, or light a um, hundred dollars a year for something, right? I spend a hundred dollars, you know, a week on Pokemon cards. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan on Pokemon cards yeah. and a hundred dollars a year. That's like, if you're a fan of something, you're likely going to spend more than that. But let's just say a hundred dollars a year, a hundred dollars a year times a thousand people is a six figure business. Mm -hmm. Right. And likely if you're focusing so deep in that little niche, you could probably get thousands of dollars from an individual who want to go deeper with you. And so it's this idea of, you know, are you, you want to go one mile wide, one inch deep where you can only serve each sort of sector of that uh, landscape, you know, just a little bit, or do you want to take a little chunk an inch wide and go a mile deep with them? And now you're serving them with some software products at the top and let's go vertical. Now you're serving them with some coaching programs. Now they're traveling to go to your mastermind group. The same person now can interact with you in many different ways. And you have this like ladder now that they're climbing to go higher and higher into your brand and also to become more and more of a fan. Um, the question that I ask myself and my team asks ourselves every day is this, like, have we earned a fan today? Because when you think about the thousand true fans, that's a fan a day for less than three years. Yeah. Some people struggle with business for years before they make it. But if you just had one new fan a day, less than three years, mm -hmm. six figures. That's, yeah. I mean, and that's, that's amazing. And I'm thinking of the whole, uh, you know, fans plus funnels. It's exactly what you said. It's like, okay, you track this fan and then the funnel can help, you know, bump that a hundred dollars to the thousand dollars. Exactly. And yeah. So exactly. it's that blend of the two of them. Super powerful. Talk about the, um, I know you have this whole pyramid in the book. This is how it's all structured. And I like the yeah, book, yeah. how it's, it's extremely tactical and that's, you know, it's like story and tactics. Uh, but you have a flow. I think it's what four steps, the, the mm -hmm. pyramid of, um, of fandom. So yeah. if you lately cover that and show us the process of what it takes to become a super fan or attract super fans, that is. Sure. And, and I like what you said about funnel plus fan. I'm thinking of like fanal. Probably wouldn't. There you go. It's all yours. Planet, planet. I won't. I, I, no, I, I'll give that to somebody else. Um, so <laughs> if you imagine like a pyramid, right, or a triangle, and you divide the triangle into four different sectors, the, the largest sector is on the bottom, right, the baseline. Um, and this is essentially, this triangle represents anybody who's ever found you, right? Anybody who's ever found you, um, an engagement pyramid or the pyramid of fandom. The largest chunk at the bottom is, is what I like to call your casual audience. These are people who just found you. Maybe they found you through a Google link or a link on another website or a mention somewhere or just kind of randomly on social media. They don't necessarily know who you are yet, but they've come to you for something that you've done or offered or because somebody else shared that link or something. And this is the largest space. And as new people come in, this is where they come in. They don't, they, they're they not subscribed yet. They're not followers. Our job is to convert them from there to the next tier, a little bit smaller, but more powerful. And that's the active audience sector. And this is where people are now subscribed. They're following you. This is the point at which they know who you are. And when you come out with something, maybe even a product to sell, they're like, okay, cool. Like I, I, I like this person. I'm active in, in their subscribership and, you know, I'll see if this works for me or not. And they'll at least sort of entertain the position of, of the offer more than just somebody who finds you randomly for the first time. Um, and then moving up from there, we need to convert our active audience members to feel like they're a part of a connected community. And the connected, connected community is really where the magic starts to happen and where your brand starts to differentiate itself from other brands doing a lot of the same things. And when you think about community, you think of people not just coming because of you or you talking to them or them talking to you, it's them talking to each other. There's like that commonality of the brand to have as a baseline for people to find each other and talk to each other 
and have some common ground to start off with versus just random people. And that is so, so powerful. If you imagine going to a baseball game and your team is down by three runs and there's two outs, your, your guy's up to bat with two outs and Boomy hits a grand slam to win, you're high-fiving and hugging people that you've never met before mm-hmm. because you're in the stands with the home crowd and they're all wearing the same symbol that you have on your hat, right? It's like that's the kind of feel that a community can have. And of course, fandom is on top of that in a little tiny pyramid, but that's like the thousand true fans up there who are just wacko for you, right? And, and it's cool. Um, and, and I say that in, in kind of a humanist way, but it's so important to understand just how powerful a small group of fans can a- actually be. I mean, these guys, these guys are going to wave your flag so high. They're going to promote your stuff without ever asking. If you have a troll show up in your audience, like th- <laughs> you won't even know because they're already right. fending them off for you, right? Like that's how important a fan can be. And this progression of casual to active to community to um, super fans is, is, is really the way that the book is structured and each chapter is sort of like okay here's how you do uh how, here's how you convert somebody from a casual audience member to active and and that's really where it starts and it's funny because we're talking about a pyramid and what happens when you flip that pyramid upside down you got your, your funnel. funnel right yeah. you got our funnel but the problem with the funnel is when you build it and you should build it it's like oh all we have to do is pour from the top and everything happens and it's like you lose the human factor um Whereas if you flip it over and you think really about where's most of the engagement, where are most of your repeat customers coming from, where's most of the money being spent, it's at the top of the pyramid, hmm. but it's not a funnel anymore. You have to climb the pyramid. There's there's gravity sort of uh, working against you here. And so it does take work. And, and this book will show you how to like, you know, have anti-gravity, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And you make a good point. That it's like you can grow from within. You don't need to keep pouring gasoline and find more of the casual fans. You can and you should. But yeah, figure out what, what you're doing with the people you already have. It's There's a common, I mean, you probably hear it all the time too. How do I grow my podcast? How do I get more emails on my email list? Mm-hmm. It's all very important. But at the same time, it's like, how many people do you already have subscribed roughly? You know, obviously, we don't know the numbers. But how do you how do you actually make those guys super fans, those gals super fans, instead of just like, need more traffic, need more traffic? It's probably yeah. focus there with the people that kind of know you first and work them up the pyramid and look or the the ladder here. That's so important because imagine somebody who's in your community who goes to their friend and goes, "Yo, you got to check out you know this community here because uh, you know hustle flowchart is just amazing and this is what the guys do and this is like how it works. You got to check it out." A recommendation from a friend. There, there's no better recommendation than one that comes from a trusted friend. I think it was Mark Zuckerberg who said that, right? So now people are coming into the pyramid, growing it from the inside, and they're not coming in casual anymore. They're coming in active already because mm-hmm. somebody convinced them to do that. So your marketing engine is already built. You just have to feed that engine a little bit and help them help the brand even more. And like you said, like I, I have done very little. Like Actually, SEO on my website is very poor right now. I have hardly spent any money on advertising ever. It's all from within the brand. And when people talk about the podcast, when people talk about how I've helped them with others, they already feel like they have somebody they can trust when they land on my website, even for the first time. Hmm. Now, this this question, I'm not I'm not totally sure where we're going to go with it, but I'm curious <laughs> with 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 the the smart passive income brand. You've got your blog, you've got your podcast, and it it sort of. It, it kind of became a, a standard in the industry for like how to do content marketing right. It, it, your brand grew huge over the years. I'm curious what you think that the sort of X, X factors about your brand, your blog, your podcast, what differentiated you from all the other stuff that was starting around the same time that no longer exists? Like, what do you think was different about what you were doing? That's a great question. I know the exact answer because we've looked for this answer before. I think that's so important is that as you're building a brand to actually hear from those who are following you, why do you follow me, right? So Mm. that you can just do more of that. Why guess anymore? If anybody's marketing and guessing, you're doing it wrong. You have to know that you're doing the right things and just then you can support that and the people that you're serving. So over the years, I've come to understand that people come to me and have come to me and have found me for a number of different reasons. Number one, in the entrepreneurial space in general, which especially in the early 2000s era was filled with and riddled with Lamborghinis and mansions Mm -hmm. and these dudes who are like get rich quick and all those nasty ads. And I'm not going to mention any names or anything. (laughs) They go, Oh my gosh, this is so refreshing. Cause it's just like a dude. He's not talking about his mansions. And it's, and and for a while I made this joke with that. Like my Lamborghini was a 2012 Toyota Sienna. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I made that joke after I knew that that's what people were hooked on. The fact that I talked about my family and that I was doing this for financial security with my family so we could spend more time together. And I feel like I've definitely done a good job of, of representing the kind of entrepreneur who wants to do this for their family, not the one who wants to live a laptop lifestyle on the beach. By the way, who uses their laptop on the beach because they're sand? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know why ever that became a thing, but um, that's one reason. Another reason, and this was almost accidental, uh, was back in October, no, uh, October, November of 2008. This was the first month after I launched my ebook at greenexamacademy.com, my architecture website. Hmm. I just wanted to share, hey guys, this is actually working. Here's how much money I made from that website. This is on Smart Passive Income. It was brand new. And here's how many things I sold. Here's how much I sold it for. Here's some things I'm going to try next month. People started to share that like crazy. They were like, dude, this guy, business guy, like, I don't think he knows what he's doing, but he's sharing the whole process along the way. He's even sharing like where he's failing. And every, it's funny because every time I share more about the things that I've done wrong, my brand grows bigger. And it's kind of counterintuitive because I think a lot of us have noticed that some people only tried to put their best put, best foot forward, um, yeah. you know, and, and they only share the good parts. But I think it becomes A, more real when I share all the parts, but B, having this sort of behind the scenes look at everything builds trust. And it also gives something uh, for people to feel special that they have that other people aren't having. Um, mm. I, I talk about that in the book, the sort of, you know, bringing people backstage with you, mm. right? Mm. And, and kind of showing them around a little bit. Um, that, that builds trust, like a factory tour kind of situation. And every month, the income statements continue to grow. Uh, as far as viewers, people started to share it. And it's what I'd become known for. However, in 2018, I had to stop them because, I mean, we were getting, you know, $250,000 plus a month now at this point. And people were coming in and they were like, I can never do that, Pat. This isn't inspiring to me. This is deflating. Like mm -hmm. it feels far removed. So even though we're still making great money, we've removed the income reports because they've served their purpose. But in the beginning, it was definitely like, wow, I could do that too. Like that's within my range. And somebody's showing me exactly how to do that. And then number three, and I think, for, uh, you know, the, the, the number one thing that's, that's helped contribute to my success was like slow growing the relationships, not trying to go so fast. And I had spent years developing relationships with my audience and other people in the industry, serving them first. I go to people who are, you know, in the industry and I go like, hey, here's how I can help you or what, do you, what might you need next? I volunteer at their events and other things like that that aren't required, but, they, but become noticed. Um, and those, those things have all played a role because relationships is really the key. And I feel like I have the ability to sort of connect with somebody through a lens in the camera or through a mm -hmm. microphone really, really well. And oftentimes that's because I know exactly what a person's going through. I know who, who my target audience is. I know the objections they have in their head. And that's so, so key. And that's what I talk about in my chapter called learn the lyrics, right? Mm -hmm. Cause I tell this story about my wife who uh, is a huge Backstreet Boy fan, right? Like almost like like dangerously uh, a fan of, of, of them. Um, and what I ended up finding out was that her first memory of this band was in a moment where she had just broken up with her boyfriend and the song Quit Playing Games With My Heart played on the radio. And she, she's, this is her exact words. I heard it all the time. I heard that song all the time, but this time it hit different because mm -hmm. in that moment, every lyric in that song was like literally what she was living at that time. So knowing who your audience is important knowing how they talk is even more important. And when you use those same words and you tell stories that relate to those people, I mean, they're going to listen. They're going to come to you for advice. And I think it was Jay Abraham who said, if you can define the problem better than your target customer, they're going to automatically assume you have the solution. That's right. Yeah, I love that. I, you know, at the, at the risk of sort of sounding like a fanboy here, um, <laughs> the original way that I discovered you was back in 2009, I quit my job and I started digging around for other people that were doing online marketing, specifically content marketing. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember if it was 2009 or 2010 when I did, when I uh, found Smart Passive Income, but around that time I, I found you, I read your bio and I was like, he lives in San Diego. <laughs> I believe if I'm, if, if I'm right, I think you're about 38, right? So you're right around the, the same age as me. You're yeah. in San Diego. You're doing content marketing through blogging and podcasting. You just left job. I mean, you got laid off. I quit, but we were both recently out of the job. So pretty much like your story and my story almost like lined up perfectly. And I've followed everything you've done ever since. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's so great. Thank you, Matt. I, I appreciate that. It's so funny to hear these stories. I love it. And that, that speaks to a chapter in the book about just like, 
connecting with other people and having commonality with your audience, right? And this is, you know, I remember when I started my podcast, I had this idea to connect with my audience that at the beginning of every episode, I would uh, actually have my voiceover guy read a fun, random little fact about me. Hmm. And I went to my mentors and, and my podcasting friends at the time, and I was like, guys, I got this great idea. And I told them, and they were like, Pat, it's like the dumbest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> Why would you waste your time, let alone let, like pay your voiceover guy to do that for you? Like, what's the point? And I was like, you know, I just, that's me. And I wanted to just like connect with people. And they're like, okay, we'll do whatever. Well, 65 million downloads later, they're coming back to me and they're like, Pat, dude, that was actually a really genius move. And I'm like, I just want to be a human online because we are removed from the direct connection. But on a podcast, I can just share the fact that I was in marching band and I, I was obsessed with it. Or the fact that I'm a huge Back to the Future fan or the fact that I'm scared of spiders or half Filipino or whatever. And if any one of those things I just said relates to something that you've been a part of or are, you can't help but go, oh, no way. For real, yeah. like, let me let me dig a little bit deeper, right? And I had this woman once who I was at an event and, you know, I'm walking around and I, this woman's screaming from the other side of the room. She goes, Pat Flynn, big baby, big baby <laughs> Pat Flynn. And I'm like, what the heck is, like, I was with a friend and I was like, what the heck is she doing? Like, I thought she was drunk or something. And I come up to her and she goes, oh my gosh, Pat, I'm a huge fan. Thank you so much. Like, I appreciate you. I listen to your show every day. And I'm like, yeah, but why did you call me a big baby? Like, I just don't, what? And she was like, <laughs> she got really flushed. She didn't understand, like, or she, she knew that I didn't get it. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. Like, I remember in one of your episodes, you'd mentioned that you were an 11 pound, 12 ounce baby. And that's like, mm. <laughs> that's what I remember. Cause I had a huge baby too. And I was just like, oh, that's so funny that like, before we meet, you literally say the thing that we're connected with. <laughs> I just happened to forget that because I have 400 <laughs> plus episodes of that. But, um, and that is true. I was an 11 pound, 12 ounce baby. I set a record at the hospital. Haven't grown much since, but <laughs> I- um, Fat baby. <laughs> yeah, fat baby. And just that, that was all my growing, I guess. But uh, yeah. You're adding the weight in the facial hair now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It, it's, it's all about connections, right? So that, the, the theory is like, let's just be more of you. Like embrace your weird. If you're super weird because you obsess over Back to the Future, like just let it be known. Put it into your content every once in a while. It's not going to be the center of everything. I remember following uh, Jeremy Shoemaker. Yeah. Um, um, from shoemoney.com. He's yep. gotten famous from sharing that like $100,000 yeah. AdSense check. Right. I followed him because I ran across a blog post where he was talking about UFC. And that was like, oh, you're into UFC? I was into UFC at the time too. And I was like, yo, this guy's sick. And then I got into deeper into his content. And I was like, cool. Like just that little thing did it for me. Yeah, it's the little things. And and that's where, yeah, I mean, all the way, I want to make sure we pivot to affiliate marketing a little bit more the rest of the time we got. But it sounds like yeah, yeah. right from the beginning when you started, you were pretty dang open, you know, just to freely share your journey on the podcast and all that. And I, I mean, I only wish that we started this bad boy a long time ago. We're four years in on our show here now, but mm -hmm. I think that's, it's probably the best way you could have started or anyone start is to, yeah, put the relatability out there, the challenges, anything you're learning, even if it's a progress along the way, it seemed like it was like that combined with what you're doing with interesting people. Uh, it's it's a, just a, an amazing way to connect. And like we were saying before, podcast is still probably one of the, be, the best ways to do that yeah. at scale. Yeah, for sure. You know, I think that you, you make a great point. Like it's a small thing that I talked about myself about. Like literally I had my voiceover guy do it. I didn't even say it. And I think right. that actually worked out my benefit because if I started a podcast going, hey, it's Pat Flynn here. Did you know that I was in the marching band for seven years and like actually took an extra architecture class in college just to be in the marching band one more year, which is actually true. Um, it'd be like, okay, well, why are you talking about yourself for so long? Like I came here for affiliate marketing advice. Like, can you get to it? And, and I see this all the time. I actually see it and people don't even know they're doing it because we are taught to share how uh, much knowledge we know and our credentials. Like I do website reviews on the weekend on my YouTube channel. And so often I see people's web pages and they're like, hi, my name is Brendan. I'm a this and I'm an MBA and I do this and I can help people do this. And I, 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 and I'm like, you need to have more use, meaning the audience mm -hmm. in the language and the copy. And the more you can do that, the more you're going to connect. And then you earn the right to talk about yourself and your credentials. But we need to nail the problem first, like I said earlier, and then people will listen to what you have to offer and why you're different. 
So I, I have one last question before we, we sort of shift topics here. Um, when it comes to like digital marketing and the stuff that you talk about a lot, how do you, how do you stay passionate for so long on the same topic, you know, putting out as much content as you're putting out on this topic? I know for me personally, I've been doing digital marketing stuff since 2000. Seven, and you know my my passion for it kind of goes like this all the time. I have months where I'm kind of like, ah, I don't even want to talk business stuff anymore, mm-hmm. and then I have months where I'm just really excited about the latest technology or something like that. So I'm I'm kind of curious how do you how do you stay excited about the topic you're constantly talking about? That's a great question. There's two two ways I go about it. Number one, I think about the person who hadn't heard all the other interviews that I've done, who has never been on my blog, that person deserves because they often will have the same problems, if not a bigger problem than other people who have already served. So I'm not going to take the self, not that that's a selfish thing to do, but like, I'm not going to remove the ability to help somebody new Mm -hmm. simply because I've already helped people before. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's kind of how I think about it. And, that, and, and that's, I don't know if that's just a mind trick or something that I do to just re- t- you know, tell that story in a different way, but that, that helps me because, mm-hmm. and, and this is how I get so excited every time I come on a new podcast and I tell a story that I've told you know, hundreds of times before. I absolutely love it because it might help the new person who's just being introduced to me for the first time. And that, that, that motivates me uh, for sure. And the second thing is like, I also know that there is always more room to grow. And for me, part of what motivates me is the challenge to always get incrementally better um, every single day. And that's fun to me to see, you know, if I create a YouTube video, how much better, if at all, was this video than the last video I did. And I look at the numbers and I sort of play this little gamification with myself to try to improve. And I think as a byproduct of that, I end up in a great space. But at the same time, on the micro level, I'm excited about the next thing because I want to compare it to the the other thing that I just Mm -hmm. did and see, like, did that work? Did it go better? And then I can, and then the other thing about this is I can take that information that I'm learning and then share it with everybody and help even more people. And that kind of like spirals. That's, that's kind of how I keep myself motivated with stuff that, you know, on the surface for sure, definitely can be sort of, you know, just kind of repetitive in in nature. Mm. Yeah. It's almost like you have a deeper meaning. You're doing these constant split tests of how you're presenting it into the world. And you're like, oh, okay, that one's hitting better. Let's refine that. Yeah. No, I could, I could relate to that for sure. Now, when it comes to affiliate marketing, and I want to bring up equity uh, deals you have as well, and, or advisory deals, which can be a, a kind of hybrid combo thing. Um, yeah. You mentioned that's one of the simpler ways to get started in business to at least raise some revenue for yourself or bring revenue in. Affiliate marketing. Mm-hmm. Affiliate marketing, yes, not the equity part. That's a later progression. But um, I guess, yeah, I know you have a whole course on affiliate marketing too that we'll shout out as well because I know well, it's amazing. Yeah, of course. So when it comes to affiliate marketing and content and putting everything out into the world and super fans, of course, what's your perspective there for someone that just wants to get started uh, with getting their first affiliate commissions in? How would you go about doing that? And uh, I mean, from there, we can maybe progress into two, you know, rev share deals and equity, kind of the progression. Yeah, the, the equity stuff is amazing, especially because it started with affiliate relationships and then it kind of grew into that, which is really cool. But, you know, as far as super fans are concerned, like, the work you do to build super fans means the affiliate marketing will be much easier. There's less crazy copy needed. There's less more aggressive marketing tactics. Literally, the more a fan uh, uh, somebody is of you, the less you have to do to convince a person to go through one of your links uh, to get a product, right? And of course, there's a lot of nuances to this, like making sure you choose the right product that does align to their goals and how you promote it and how you showcase that product to show that it's simple and easy to use and, and whatnot. But as far as affiliate marketing is concerned, like I think the biggest thing to realize is that you're you're always supposed to come from a place of service, but the best way to do it would be as far as content platforms is to use any mechanism you can or any content platform you have to have access to in its best form to showcase the product that, um, and, and what I mean is, you know, podcasting is great for storytelling, right? So for example, I promote ConvertKit, which is an email service provider. Now I could go on a podcast and go, okay, here's how you do email marketing. First, you got to go to this page here. And then you click on this button. Again, podcast, not going to work, right? Mm. That's Mm. what the YouTube channel is for. On video, I have a demo video. If you look up ConvertKit on YouTube, I usually hone in on number one or number two spot. And people watch that video, whether they know me or not, because they're there for just to learn about the product. Mm. And then if I give them value, if I share some tips along the way, they like, you know, how I, my style is, they might download my lead magnet and or go into through my affiliate link to get the thing that I've just convinced them that is so easy to use. Hmm. 
So that's video. But what about, a, what about on a podcast? Well, here's what I did. I invited Nathan Barry, the CEO of ConvertKit on the show. And I had him come on, not to talk about email marketing. I had him come on just to tell the story behind ConvertKit, to learn from what he learned about building it, it almost failing, all these crazy things. And throughout that, people listening can now trust that product even more. And then, of course, at the end, I go, hey, and by the way, if you're interested in this product and email marketing, you can either watch the demo video on YouTube or you can go through this link here if you want to get a free trial, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's the cool thing. Like people, the hard thing with affiliate marketing is you're not selling your own product. So we have to convince the person on the other end that that product is worthy of purchasing. Hmm. Another great way to do this is to just show your own experience with it. This is one thing that's worked really, really well for me is not creating blog posts to go, here's the product and here's how great it is. And I do do that sometimes, but instead think about it like this goal, build a website. Cool. Here's a free blog post series, five blog posts that will go from, from scratch to having a website day one, you got to nail branding and it's all stuff that people can do with a notepad day two, you got to get a domain. Here's some suggestions I have for picking a domain name. And by the way, if you're looking to actually get a domain, Here's the hosting service I would recommend, right? Okay, step three, step four. Okay, step five, keyword research, really important. By the way, there's a keyword research tool that can save you hours of time. I would love for you to join me on a webinar to show you exactly how to do keyword research for free and also introduce this product to you. Cool, I'm getting people signing up. And then my favorite thing to do in a webinar, especially for software, if you're selling software, like just showing people how to use it and how much time you're saving doing it is the best. Mm -hmm. So I have this approach that I want you all to take and you can use it whichever way you want. It's demonstrating the free way to do something and the headache free way to do something, right? Yeah. Free, headache free. So on this webinar, right? I have 35 minutes up front. Hey guys, I'm gonna teach you how to do keyword research for free. You literally don't need to pay anything. I'm gonna go into Google AdWords keyword tool. I'm gonna do all the hard effort of putting it in an Excel file. It's just like, you know, it's working and I'm getting the data I need, but it's taking so much time. And then I go, hey, by the way, remember that thing I told you? Uh, this is the product It does come with a cost, but I'll show you why this matters and why this is such a great investment. Because everything we just did in the last 35 minutes, boom, we just did it in two seconds. Here's all the data you need and here's what you can do with it. People's minds are blown. They're like, oh my gosh, look how much time saved. Like the juxtaposition of free versus headache free becomes the reason why that person's more comfortable spending money with you. And of course, if you've helped them, not just learn about keyword research, but all, all along the way, getting their brand in line, Getting, that, getting them up on a domain name, helping them with building their website and picking a theme, which could also come with a commission. Like I now have four payment moments with a person by teaching content for free. Mm -hmm. It's the best. It's awesome, dude. <laughs> and you're creating and a super fan throughout that process, I would imagine. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And what happens, Google's like, oh my gosh, like a lot of people are coming to this or sharing it, let's rank it really high, mm -hmm. right? So it's just like... Everybody wins. I love it. <laughs> it's the best. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I mean, that's an amazing model. And uh, I think you touched on that in the live stream last time too. But now with this bigger context of super fans and content that you can layer on that, it's just an amazing uh, formula. Someone can swipe just right now. Yeah. Uh, now, when it comes to, let's say, equity deals, I know that's that's progressing quite a bit. What are some of the, I guess, the qualifiers that make someone feel like, okay, I'm worthy of getting an equity deal or approaching a company uh, as an advisor? Yeah, you know, like how, you know, at least like having that hat on, because I feel like there's a worthiness first that someone has to kind of frame in their minds. And then it's positioning of how to actually show up and be someone of value there. What's your right. perspective there? And how would you, how would you approach a new deal? Yeah, you can't just go to a random company and be like, Hey, I'm, I advise companies. Do you need an advisor? Like that's not going to work ever. Right. right. All the advisorship work I do, and I'm now an advisor for uh, six to seven companies. And I say that because one's sort of getting acquired right now, which is cool. Nice. Um, yeah. There has to be some sort of relationship ahead of time. All the companies I've had, I've had a relationship with from Clay uh, Collins over at lead pages before he mm -hmm. left as CEO to Nathan Barry, to Anker over at Teachable, to the guys over at Sam Cart, to Squadcast. And there's even more works and there's more deals in the work right now. And the beauty of this is like, typically, I mean, it's different for every company, but you know, one call a month just to kind of essentially tell them how things are on the front lines and what I think could be done better or a couple board meetings a year. And literally that's it. I'm not like an employee, I'm an advisor. When they need help, they can come to me for help. 
when I see that there's a relationship that I could connect that company with somebody with for, I don't know, investment opportunities or whatever. Cool. If, I, if that's there, I'm going to help them out. Also, what's really cool is I can go to a company that I'm advisor to and I can be like, hey, I, you know, I believe that this product should be like this. And let me show you why. And here's some feedback from my audience too. And they actually like implement it. Like a lot of the stuff that people use on ConvertKit and on lead pages is a result of specifically what I thought back in the day. How like I'm using these tools and now I get to even shape these tools and I even get to have equity in the company such that if it were to go, you know, ex exit at one day, I get a nice big check. Like that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, but that relationship has to happen first and you need to almost sort of have the ability to prove yourself, right? And that can come in many forms. Maybe you are an affiliate already and you're just like churning volume, right? That's a great starting point, at least, because then that company will know, well, you've done a lot for them already. What else can we do together, right? And let's take it to that next step in the relationship. Um, sometimes it comes from you spending the time to do deep research on that company, what they're doing, what they're doing wrong. And literally, like I, one time I wrote a report for a company. It was like four pages. It was like 10 things that this company, not going to mention names, is not doing to the best ability. And it was, it was sort of like a pitch deck, but not really. It was just more like a friendly email. And these guys came back and they're like, dude, this is exactly what we need. We, we never had any perspective like this before. Like, hmm. let's talk. And so we talked. And I said, you know, I have this unique perspective in this blogosphere and, and, and as a podcaster that I could provide for you. You know, sure, we can do a higher affiliate deal, but I don't need more money. I, I, I would love to, you know, influence the company and, and, and even uh, help out even more. Can we talk about advisorship? And, you know, yes, uh, it's, awesome. it's just, it's just super cool. And again, if you have value to add, that's where uh, things open up. Yeah. I love it. Perfect, man. Well, I want to, uh, we have a few more minutes here, so let's, let's wrap it up. Uh, what's shout out your, your affiliate uh, as well, but we'll link that in the show notes. Just so uh, the affiliate that. course you said? Uh, the course. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The course. Yeah. One, two, three affiliate marketing. You know, it's, it's, it's literally right. easy as one, two, three. It's not an overnight thing, but I try to simplify things. I think we as entrepreneurs often overcomplicate everything. And one thing I like to ask myself and I would recommend we all ask ourselves is, well, if this were easy, what would it look like? Right. And when mm -hmm. it comes to affiliate marketing, I've distilled it into the main things that people need to know to make it work. You know, one, two, three first, second, third, and you follow that process. And people, the nice thing about this course is it's like, it's one of the ones that it's so obvious that there's an ROI on it. And if you don't get the ROI, you just within 30 days, you get your money back. So it's like, there's no nice. reason not to get it. Right. So uh, anyway, I, I don't want to pitch it too much here, but um, <laughs> uh, I appreciate cool. you allow, allow me to share that. Of course, man. It's relevant. And then of course, super fans, the book, um, I know patflynn.com is your, your main uh, website. Is that how right. they can find it? Smart passive income probably, right? Yes, both of those podcast. websites, it's it's yeah. everywhere. You can look up super fans on Amazon. Um, I'm just very proud of that book because although it didn't get Wall Street Journal bestseller like my other book did, it's selling more books. And that's nice. what matters most yeah. because people are sending me Instagram messages every day of, of, of the exercises that they're doing and implementing and actually having it have an effect. Like, um, remember the, the what's up strategy I shared with you mm -hmm. earlier? Like that's one that I talk about in the book and I get messages every day of, of people just like, Hey, I did a what's up and this, look at how happy I made this person. Like, thank you so much. It's just, Man. and, and this book is like, it's not revolutionary things. It's stuff we already have access to. It's not brand new information. It's just mm. like, Hey y'all, let's like focus our efforts here. Cause this is what matters. And here are some ways that you can do that. It's connecting, man. Yeah, it's connecting at a time where I think people really need this message. And that's For where sure. that's what we've been preaching too. It's like this is the year to really double down on your connections and then fan base as well. It's gonna take you I far. Agree with that. 100 percent Cool, my man. Well, any any last things? Anyway, uh Instagram too. Go follow Pat on Instagram. <laughs> okay, you have some you. of the coolest damn videos. <laughs> Joe was watching all the TikTok style. It's hilarious. Oh morning. yeah. <laughs> Dude, I've been having a lot of fun scratching my creative itch. And the nice thing is it's it's only contained to like 30 seconds. So I, right. I, I don't have to <laughs> sort of overwork myself for that. But yeah, thank you. At Pat Flynn on Instagram and at Pat Flynn anywhere else, um, Clubhouse or you know, whatever's new. Probably Clubhouse? at Pat Shout Flynn. Shout out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, my man. Thanks for your time, man. It's been fun. Cool. Thanks, guys.